The view in our cognitive scientists today is that we construct our perceptions of reality in real time. The question was, could we be misinterpreting the content of our perceptual experiences? And what is our current understanding in the biology of science? According to evolution, what we perceive with our brain and our senses does not reflect the true natures of the reality. Why should you care? The implications of such radical finding rock the foundations of our belief system that space-time is fundamental. In this series, we are delighted to have Professor Emeritus of Cognitive Science Donald Hoffman and Professor of Developmental and Synthetic Biology Michael Levin joining us today to discuss the idea and we are going to look at what is a conscious agency. Welcome, Professor Levin. Welcome, Professor Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. How's the new year treating both professors so far? Did you both have a good holiday? Yeah, sure. Yes. Healthy and uneventful, which is good. <laughs> yeah, nothing to complain about. Any? <laughs> nothing to complain about. So any, any new project for 2023? Uh, many, many, many things. Uh, so, so in our lab, uh, we have a, a variety of uh, kind of uh, conceptual and computational projects, and also a bunch of bench work stuff. So, we have we have lots of things going on in the in the areas of well, the practicalities come out as uh, cancer, um, birth defects, regenerative medicine, those kinds of things. It is our desire to understand collective intelligence, which I think is all intelligence, and and how it is that uh, minds are sort of um, uh, emerge in the in the physical world. And so so we we are finding new ways to try to communicate with with cellular uh, swarms in the body as a kind of collective intelligence. And we've got some some interesting things on at looking at the different uh, competencies of things like gene regulatory networks, um, in addition to other other models like slime molds and things so yeah lot, lots of lots of new stuff on that along along those lines busy it's going to keep you busy and don you uh, that's that's quite a list Mike. that's an impressive list um well we're we're focused on a, a number of projects but most interesting to me is the physicists um tell us that space time is doomed and they're they're not just saying that they're finding new structures beyond space time, right? They're 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 actually finding these structures like the amplitudehedron and the deepest structure are something called decorated permutations, and but but these are just like static structures beyond space time. We've been looking for a dynamics beyond space time, um, dynamical system that would actually give rise to these structures like the. The deepest structure is the decorated permutation. And so we just published a paper last week in which we did that. So we, we prove that uh, it's apparently a new mathematical result that you can canonically map Markov chains, uh, any Markov chain to decorated permutations. And so that, that gives us a window now to start to interpret these, these structures beyond space time in terms of Markovian dynamics. And so that's what we're doing now. So we have uh, the, the the project I'm working on now is to show we, we have a, a Markovian dynamics of conscious agents. That's what made us look after you know, these Markov chain ideas and see if we could you know turn them into decorated permutations. That was the motivation because we already have a Markovian dynamics of consciousness. And so that's what we're up to now is, OK, now that we have this map of our conscious agent dynamics, so it's a, model of conscious agents beyond space time into decorated permutations that now should instruct us exactly how to port specific properties of the conscious agent dynamics to specific physical properties like mass momentum spin and energy and so forth so that's that's what i'm excited to do because that link has told us where exactly to look in our conscious agent dynamics and so we're looking there and we're finding some beautiful mathematical structures and getting hints about how they project to properties in space time. So, so we're trying to, so that's my project, um, to map that out and then make explicit proposals for how 
kind could be tested with the data on um, the inner structure of protons. So the scattering uh, experiments that have been done since the 1960s uh, at, at Stanford Linear Accelerator and then much more powerful ones later on have given us a tremendous amount of, of detail about the inner structure, the quark, gluon, and so forth, the structure of the parton structure of, of and, and their momentum distributions inside protons. So that's my goal this year is to try to actually predict those distributions from a theory of, of conscious agents that's beyond space time. That would be that would be a good year. Um, on the 20th of December, Professor Levin tweeted, when I was five, I asked my dad where a certain toy was that I couldn't find. He said, you know how today's clicks over into tomorrow while you sleep at night. Well, the toy didn't make it. I wouldn't say that's responsible for my old weird thinking patterns, but I spent a long time thinking about how frame of time and days works. How some object passed from yesterday to today and how that apparently can fail. And how we as minds stay in yesterday or successfully make it forward. Try to stay up all night to catch the trans transitions. Very disturbing at the time. Professor Levin, could you speak on the toy that missing? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I remember it uh, quite clearly. Um, it was a it was a it was some sort of plastic gun or something like this, and uh, and I remember my my I, I couldn't find it anywhere, and I'm sure I'm sure probably somebody threw it away. And my dad, without skipping a beat, he said he said, oh yeah, you know, like at night when things you know go over from today to tomorrow, yeah, it didn't make it. So you know, that's it. You can give up. <laughs> it just it didn't make it. And I walked away thinking, oh my god, that's. That, there's a thought like like what well what determines whether things make it and 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 what if I don't make it and 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 what happens and then I tried to stay up of course all night wanting to catch that um you know wanting to catch that moment uh when if I wasn't I wasn't able to I would just fall asleep somewhere around midnight and I'm like damn I missed it again um but you know uh so I don't know how much how much that was responsible for some of the strange things I think about but um. I do. I do think that uh, one one of the things that I've been thinking about recently is this, uh, which I think it relates to that, is this notion of uh, a lot of what we do relates to this notion of selfhood or being a self. You know, what does it mean to be a permanent or or not not a permanent but a stable cognitive structure? Because much like with bodies, which are a kind of ship of Theseus sort of thing, right? Molecules come and go all the time. Cells come and go all the time. But something stays the same. So what is that? And what are the policies that the other cells and molecules are implementing that allows some sort of stable, large-scale collective to remain while the low-level parts are swapped out at will? And it's not always a policy to maintain status quo. It might be more metamorphosis. It might be um, all kinds of changes that, you know, regeneration and development. May, may, but, but in any case, you need to maintain some sort of large-scale coherence, even though the parts are, are, are changing out all the time. So I was thinking about this with respect to the uh, to, to cognition as well. If you're going to be a stable mind of some sort, you need to allow ideas and go, and uh, you need to be in different states. But it it can't be something that just completely erases you. You know, every time you have a new thought, well, that's it. Now you're you know now you're gone. So 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 that. That, that balanced with the opposite idea, which comes from many places, but among them from, from Buddhist ideas of, of, of an impermanent self or perhaps an illusory, even a, even maybe an illusory self. So I've been I've been thinking about that a lot and trying to play with these ideas of stability, but uh, but changeability and the robustness and yet um, flat plasticity. And one way I now think about this is that the self is it it's not so much that it's completely illusory but it but it has to be recreated at every moment in time and what i mean by that is just that at any given moment right now everything you know about or you think you know about yourself your past everything else you have to reconstruct from the memory traces in your brain you don't actually have access to anything that really happened before whether they be molecules or, or physiological structures, we actually don't know what it is really. But whatever it is that you've got hold of right now, you have this narrow uh, slice of now, which is, I don't know, a couple of hundred milliseconds maybe. And that's your self. And then you, you sort of have to reconstruct everything you think you know 
from whatever memory molecules or you know engrams that you find laying around in your in your brain. That's your only. And of course, people have played with this, uh, you know, for the, these sort of. Um, uh, I think I think maybe Hume or somebody it's a, you know or or Boltzmann brains you know this idea that all your memories could have been created and they really hadn't been and I, and I don't mean I don't mean this 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 sort of bizarre um, skeptical th thing that can't be disproven I just mean literally that at every moment as a cognitive agent you have to be constructing a model of yourself from the evidence that you have which and where does it come from well whatever engrams happen to be in your in your you know in your brain and so. This, uh, you know, you can imagine yourself as these like slices in this, in this, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure, I'm sure this is, you know, as Don was saying, this is probably a, an outdated view already, but I sort of imagine it as these slices of this, of this giant space time loaf, so to speak. And each, and each one, you are basically, you have to recreate yourself from scratch. And, uh, and, and then, and if, and, and, and that way, what happens is that you can think of, Everything you've done in the past and all the memories that were formed in the past, patients from a past self to a future self, and everything you're doing now are messages that you are in fact leaving for your future self in a way, right? Because so the memories that you're forming now and the things you're doing now are things that some future version of you is going to be using those to base their model of what the heck is going on and when and who am I? And and, and of course there are medical versions of this. So people with anterior grade amnesia who can't form new memories. What do they do? They 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 leave right. So 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 you wake up in the morning. You've got this notepad, and on the notepad, first thing it says is, "Hey, by the way, you've got anterior grade amnesia. This is who you are, and this is what's going on." And the last thing is, don't, don't forget to don't forget to write. And so we all do this all the time. It's just that our, typically our pads are internal. So that right. So that's all it is. Exactly the same problem, but because you must reconstruct yourself, it's just on a smaller scale and. And it's somehow internal. So anyway, that's uh, that's my my ramblings on that. That that's how I've been thinking about this. <laughs> Thank that's you, it. Don. What did you think time is then? Is it a is it a you know space and time? Is it more like a data structure? Could you speak on that, please, Tom? Uh, yeah, Don. That's a great, great question. I'll, I'll just say one thing along the lines of what Mike was saying. I, I agree with what you're saying, Mike, and and it's and it's quite interesting because every time you access those memories, um, you destroy them. You have to do memory reconsolidation. You have to actually rebuild the memories all the time as well. So so you're rebuilding yourself all the time. It's not like the memory is there and it's always there. No, every time you access it, you have to rebuild it. So that's striking. And it, yeah, yeah, the framework in which you're talking, Mike, you know, the space-time loaf is has been the standard you know, physicalist framework, you know, since, uh, since Einstein um, for, so for over a century now. Um, and but it's interesting how the physicists realize that 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 space time itself is is not fundamental, and so so it doesn't mean that those ideas are wrong. It 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 means that that way of thinking about them will have to be understood at a deeper level, right? We'll have to have a deeper representation beyond space time, and, and that uh, you know of, of physics or whatever beyond space time that projects down to the space time loaf. And projects down to the processes we see, like memory reconsolidation and so forth, the neural processes. So those, so so, if space and time are not fundamental, you know, then and the physicists are, the physicists are the ones who are, not me. It's the physicists that are saying space time is doomed. It it, um, their own theories. So quantum field theory and general relativity together are 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 very clear that it's a data structure that works down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and then falls apart. So it's actually a, a, a really shallow data structure. It's 10 to the minus 33, not 10 to the minus 33 trillion, just 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, the, the thing falls apart. And so, so that means that, it, by the way, time also falls apart at 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So, so I, I take the physicists at their word. Space time is doomed. And that, that means that time is doomed, right? So your, your question was about time. So, so we, we and, and that also, by the way, means that ultimately the strategy in science of that if you go to smaller and smaller scales of space time, you find more and more fundamental objects and more and more fundamental laws. That's the that's the reductionism. I, that's precisely the re reductionism. I mean, that reductionism is false. 
it, 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 it just doesn't work beyond 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And in fact, it falls apart well before then. Um, you, you get these UVIR correspondences that blow things up well before that. So, so I think that time is and space are merely interface concepts. They're, they're what, what we use to get by, um, in, but they're not the reality. And the, and the reality is something entirely outside space and time. And, and so I'll just mention that our work in evolution of natural selection agrees with, with the physicists. Evolution also entails that space and time and objects in space and time are not fundamental. So, so that, that means that neurons don't exist when they're not perceived, but, but, but that is not to put down neurobiology. It, in fact, what I say is we need more money for neurobiology because we realize it's a lot harder than we ever thought. We, we thought, you know, there's 86 billion neurons in the brain and, you know, that's a hard problem. But, but that's just the interface representation. That, that's that's the, the dumbed down version. The, the, the real complex version is being hidden from us and we have to really reverse engineer neurobiology and space time to something deeper. It's going to be far more complicated. And we'll have to see how it projects down to space time. So, so I think that that time is is not fundamental. And in our Markovian dynamics of, of conscious agents, um, there is no entropic arrow of time necessary in the dynamics. So we can have a dynamics in which there is a sequence parameter, but there is the entropy does not increase. Um, but it turns out it's a theorem that if you take a um, projection of the dynamics. Um, on by say conditional probability that any projected view of the dynamics you'll, you'll get a, a new dynamics that's a you know a projection of the bigger dynamics of the, the, the fundamental dynamics that new dynamics will have an arrow of time uh, just because of the loss of information that happened in the projection process so so that makes sense space time is just our virtual reality headset it's a projection it loses information we have an arrow of time because of that loss of information. In other words, time is not an insight into the nature of reality. It's just an artifact of the projection process, purely an artifact and not an, not an insight. There's more to say, but I'll stop there because I don't want to dumb it. <laughs> Mike, do you, you agree or you have anything to add to that, Mike? Yeah. I th well, I think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very profound idea. And, uh, and I think that, uh, I, I, I wonder if we can generalize it to say that uh, it's almost it's, it's almost guaranteed that uh, agents uh, will will build models of their world that uh, may or may not uh, agree with other agents' models of their world because, as Don has very nicely shown um, ri rigorously, uh, evolution isn't looking for that. It's just looking for uh, expedient representations. And so uh, it's entirely possible that there are, I mean, I, so, so Chris Fields and I work on this kind of stuff a lot from the perspective of observers and this idea that everything is some observer's vantage mm -hmm. point description. And so um, I think it makes complete sense to me that from certain vantage points, uh, things look like there's there's space and time, but you know it's like it's like uh, we we have mathematical tools, you know, neural nets and things like that that will take exp that take their experience and project it into some crazy space where you can't make heads or tails of what the principal components are, and 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 because and this is what happens to to us all. We make we make some kind of representation that seems to be good enough for for survival and various other things, but but none of that should be taken as 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 fundamental. And the other the other thing that um, this is maybe stepping away a little bit, but but I think it bears on this on this topic as far as you know space space and time have served uh, well they've in physics right they've done a nice job and everything, but I think I think we have to uh, somebody somebody once said I don't remember who it was that um, uh, if you show me uh, the fishing net that you're using I'll show you the fish you're going to catch which is that we have to think about what are these tools good for and what are they not good for. And one of the things that I've been increasingly uh, sort of focusing on is this idea that the world looks like a mechanical mechanistic place when you use tools that are low agency tools. So when you use voltmeters and rulers and things like this, 
all you're ever going to see is low agency stuff. You're going to see things that look like mechanism. Of course, it's going to look like mechanism because that's the le- that's the lens you're using, and uh, and so we can't then assume that well that must be right and 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 just assume that okay it's all got to be bottom up because th- those are the tools that we use. And and what if what if uh, the things you're going to find have to be in some impedance match almost or the tools that you're using and and now no and so suppose you're you're looking for things like agents or you're looking for virtual governors or top you know top down controllers you're not going to find that with 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 low agency tools what can you find that with well you find it with brains and you find it with 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 you know minds that are primed to look for agency these things that that are uh you know we we don't have a voltmeter that measures um a, you know a, a from causal information theory and whatnot, you know these 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 the things that the, you know Eric Hole and other folks uh, study these high level um, integrated information and all that. We don't you, you don't have a voltmeter of that, of course you don't. But but and so you don't find any of that when you use those tools. All you ever see is mechanism. But when you look at the world using a tool, for example, our own uh, mind and our observational um, system then we're very good at detecting agency. Of course, we make mistakes in both directions, right? We have false positive and false negatives. But but minds are really good tools to find other minds. Voltmeters are not. And so, right? So so maybe that so maybe there's something there. Maybe it's it's this idea that yes, of course, these things have been with us and they do a nice job on the kinds of things that they're good at, which is describing mechanical mechanistic interactions. And I think what what Don has highlighted very, very effectively is that, we cannot assume that well that's the you know that's our fishing net and that's all there is to find that's good. clearly right they're they're letting us find certain kinds of things and they're also obscuring lots of other important things thank you so let me summarize it don so you're saying no physical objects including my body is conscious strictly speaking right so my brain isn't conscious because my brain in fact doesn't even exist and then space time is not fundamental so this standard view that we all took for granted, the objective reality we see with our eyes is not it's raving bonkers. <laughs> so having this view with the evolution theory, has it affected your perceptions and your behavior when it comes to interacting with the world? Well, yes, and I think <laughs> the way you put it is is is. Well put, and, and what Mike has been saying is, is, is I completely agree, and it's it's brilliant, and and you, 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 the fishing net example is a, a really good example that uh, you know we don't see the world as it is; we see it through the lens of our own concepts and the way we, you know, w- what we do, and 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 there's no escaping that, and and so in 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 effect as well you know, as we talked about, you have to recreate yourself all the time, right? That was Mike Mike was saying you're always recreating yourself all the time. Um, well, you're also recreating the world all the time. So, so I, I have a body when I look and I have neurons when I look and when I don't look, they're not there. So every time I look, so, so this is really quite, if you're in a virtual reality game, your avatar um, is there only when you see it. <laughs> And or or and and the avatar that someone else sees of you is there when they see it, and as soon as they turn their headset somewhere else, that avatar is gone, and they're looking at something else. And and so yeah, we're recreating um, all the objects inside of space and time on the fly as needed, and that includes all of my neurons and my body. So the, these things, uh, you know, it's and we have the illusion that they're there all the time because every time I look, I see it. But but you can get the same illusion in virtual reality, right? But, you know, if you're, you're playing a, a good game, you can get immersed in the game. Every time I look over to the right, I see the mountain. You know, so it must mean the mountain's there all the time. No, no, you're only rendering the mountain when you look. The, the fact is you, rent, you always render the mountain every time you look that direction, but that doesn't mean the mountain was there. You still have to create it all the time. There is something, there is a reality, but so, so we, we get confused. We go, we go, well, there must be some reality. Yeah, absolutely, there is a reality. It's just not inside space and time. Because it's not inside the virtual reality, because there you have to render everything for it to exist in the, it only exists in the rendering process. So, so yes, this, this has a personal Im- impact, right? I mean, first, it, 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 um, when I first realized I had to just sit down and to, to absorb it, 
And that was 35 years ago. And I'm, I'm still absorbing it. And, and, and it's a shock to me, and I think it's a shock to almost everybody, except maybe, you know, advanced meditators and so forth, who, you know, it's, maybe for them it's not as much of a shock, but it's, it's still a shock to the system. And I think um, Piaget gave us, the, the, the very famous um, child psychologist Piaget, uh, gave us some insight as to why it's so shocking. And he, he, he pointed out that um, we're programmed to believe in what he called object permanence. He thought we got object permanence by um, 18 months. Later studies showed that um, it was, it's probably more like a three or four months. So, so this is before we're rational, right? We're, we're not reasoning and logically thinking about things. We're just programmed to believe that that doll exists and will continue to exist even if it's behind a pillow and I can't see it. But Piaget was doing so. He was looking at you know babies with dolls and when do they think when are they going to go looking for the doll that they can't see? You know when do they believe the doll still exists? And and so so we're programmed to so our belief that the sun exists even when we don't look is is not we didn't come to that belief um, based on rational logical cold logic. <laughs> we came to it at three months of age because we're programmed to believe that. And so, so that's why um, my merely intellectual understanding that it's false has not yet um, <laughs> penetrated my emotional Thank world. <laughs> it, it's still quite, quite a shock emotionally, absolutely. My that has it changed your perceptions of the world? Yeah. Um, well, I guess what, what I, I, I want to uh, say two, two, two things. Uh, what, one about uh, things that don't change and one about things that do. Um, I once... Uh, I, I once I once had lunch with uh, with a philosopher who was uh, um, a very strong skeptic on free will. And uh, when the waitress came over and said, uh, so, uh, Professor X, uh, what kind of soup uh, will you have? And she said, well, let me think. I said, hey, what what are you doing? Hey, wh why don't you sit back and see what soup gets ordered? What, what, what do you do? How, how, how do you, what, what are you doing choosing a soup here? <laughs> And and so that's just to say that I mean I understand of course the the argument and everything but but the point is it, it, the, that's one of those things that you can be you can be a skeptic about free will but I don't think you can live your life I, I think it's it's one of those views that is is just impossible to connect with on a practical level um, for a, for a strong reason that we can talk about I think I think it actually that and object permanence goes back to the bacterial you know microbial level and so we can we can talk about that but but so i think i think it is impossible for a for a coherent mind that that evolved in you know under realistic constraints to not believe in in being an agent that does things i, I think right i just don't think you can no matter how no matter what you write about free will i don't think you can live the thing that i think does change some of these things is uh, is this and and this is just a question I'll pose to all of you and and, and whoever's listening. I think it's an interesting question. I, I've done a poll of all my friends with this. Imagine and and I think people split uh, into two types of people along this this question. Uh, imagine some pleasant experience that you would be willing to pay a hundred dollars and a nice massage or something. Whatever whatever it is, it's a nice it's a nice discreet experience that you could have. And so I'm going to give you two choices. You can have that experience right now, but you're going to have no memory of it later. None. It's wiped. It wipes your memory. So, so let's say you know you've always wanted to go skydiving. It's free, but afterwards you will have no memory of having done it. Okay, so that's that's option one. Option two is the exact opposite. We're not going to do it, but you're going to have a memory of having done it, but you're not actually going to get to do it now. So, so which do you prefer? And, right and and what I, and what I find is that people people uh, have very strong feelings about this um, about about half of the people I talk and it's really about half and half I think uh, people that I talk to half of them say well uh, the the now moment is going to be gone anyway all I really have are memories of anything you know I don't care what happens now like, give me give me the memory of this beautiful you know skydive or whatever and somebody else will say. Well, who wants to go around collecting memories? I like experiences. I want to. I want to have the experience. Everything else is is fake. I'm, I live in the now. Let's do it. And so, and I don't care if I don't remember it afterwards. I'm, and so, and so, this this is a really interesting, I think, division point of how you see yourself. Do you see yourself as this like 
uh, evanescent agent and then and then you know three hours from now that's not really going to be me anyway so who cares what that i'm i want the experience now that's all that exists and then you've got the people who are like no no all i am is a, is this uh you know collection of memories so let's add to that and there is no now it'll be gone shortly so so i think pondering that one and thinking about which type you are i think i think that's kind of instructive and um and how and how different people can can really differ on that so <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a really interesting uh thing so i my, my memories my memory is not that good um i really it just like when when i first read uh, when i when i was young i first read about this this idea that your memories could be false i had i was like yeah yeah of course i could barely <laughs> I mean, my memory, I don't know, you know, I don't really trust it that much anyway. It seemed, seemed to make perfect sense. And so I'm one of these guys who takes lots of pictures and, and you know, records everything because uh, that's, uh, I find it hard to kind of re replay it later. So, so from, from, from that perspective, uh, I can, I can sort of see, see both views. I, I think that uh, uh, my memories aren't worth, the, the raw memories aren't worth all that much. So I would, I would take the immediate experience. But but in real life, I, I sort of augment that with with all kinds of stuff, right? So I you know I think tons of photographs and videos and whatnot. So yeah, I don't know. I think it's a it's a profound set of questions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I have a I have a silly question though. So dinosaurs not real? <laughs> Both of you. So are you saying that dinosaurs is not real? Then it's just a, a perceptions of us then with the VR headset. Well, so I'll, I'll go after that. So it's, it's, it's quite good. I mean, so, you know, dinosaurs disappeared, I don't know, 65 million years ago or something like that, right? And and and, and that's that's our space-time story, and it's it, I think it's a, it's a good story. Um, but but I would say, yes, there there is some reality, but it's not as it's not in space and time. And it's, if you you get the right answer if you think about virtual reality most of the time. So it, 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 I just always think about virtual reality. And, and so is, is that car that you're seeing in virtual reality, is it really there? When, well, no, it's not. It's there when you look. Is there some reality that is causing you to see that car? Yeah, but it's not a car. It's, it's maybe some supercomputer or something outside of your virtual reality. So, so, so yeah, we, we will find dinosaur bones and we will date them as 65 million years. And, and that's our virtual reality. Um, perception of it there is there is some deeper reality that that uh, you know that's real but but this is as as mike is saying we have to recreate this stuff all the time <laughs> on the fly and 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 so 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 yeah that dinosaur experience that you're having when you dig up that bone right now um that experience um only exists in the moment and that bone didn't exist and as a bone until you perceived it um there is some other reality that is somebody else who wants to go and dig in that area to see the bone right so you, you'll all agree but you also agree in virtual reality say that you know if you're playing grand theft auto that everybody would agree oh yeah you're racing a a, a green porsche everybody agrees that you're racing a green porsche that doesn't mean that there really is a green porsche it just means everybody agrees and so we all agree that we see dinosaurs and we all agree that in our headset, they look like they're 65 million years old or older. Um, but agreement doesn't mean that it has a pre-existing reality. So are you saying Max Delbrook? He, he was... Um... No, no, who's, who, who's talking right now? <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's one of the audience. Um, can we oh. move on quickly, Don? Sorry about that. To briefly talk about your model and touch on, on the conscious agency so that you and Mike could compare the two models. So you talk on your conscious agency and the mathematical sides of it, and then Mike could unpack it from his perspective on the biology side of it. Shall we go on that? Sure, sure. That and then we can go back to the Max Delbrook thing later on in the Q&A, absolutely. So I didn't want to rudely stop anybody. I just didn't know who, who was talking. <laughs> um, so so it, the, the conscious agent model is um, a, a precise model of, of consciousness. Um, I'm not saying it's the right model, but it's, it's at least mathematically precise, in which we have agents that have experiences, and based on those experiences, they take actions that affect the experiences of other conscious agents. Of interacting conscious agents 
And the, the mathematics is basically Markovian. It's a, a, a Markov chain that you get on, 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 on this collection, this network of conscious agents. And one of the things that we're, we're doing right now in the model, which is for our next paper, which is really fun, is looking at the role of observation. So the only thing to observe is other consciousnesses, right? There's, uh, the, the consciousnesses are observing consciousnesses. And it's a theorem of this theory that any collection of consciousness agents is itself a bigger agent. So ultimately, the, the math says there's one agent. But it, but it also tells us that we can never write down the one agent because you'd have to, it would be infinitely long. So you, you, you can't write it down. So, so it's interesting that the theory says there is one conscious agent, but it will transcend any precise mathematical description. But we can build as big an agent as we want. And so that's what we, what we have to do. We, so we have to be modest and build big agents, but we can't build the one agent. So, and when we, the only thing there is to observe is consciousness, and it's only conscious agents that are there to observe it. So what we can do is we can take a huge agent on a, which has a huge number of, of experiences, a huge number of states that it, that it perceives. So maybe, you know, a billion by, it's a billion states or a billion experiences that it can have. And we can then take any subset of states from it, maybe just 100,000 of them or, or 2 million. And that will also correspond to a sub-agent. So this will be a sub-agent of this bigger agent. And then we can take the Markovian dynamics of the big agent and do what's called a trace chain. We can look at the Markovian dynamics that's induced on the little agent um, as a consequence of the big dynamics. So that's called a trace chain. So every time, most of the time, the, the state of the big agent is, is not in the state of one, one of the states of the little agent. But when it does, then we will, you know, that little agent will get activated and we can then build its Markov kernel. You know, we can actually describe over time what its Markovian kernel is. So there's some big Markovian kernel, but we can induce um, little Markovian kernels on all the sub-agents. So if you have a big agent with n states, n experiences that it can perceive, then there are two to the n sub-agents, including the, the original agent, two to the n sub-agents. So, and so you have two to the n different Markovian kernels or trace chains that you can look at. And so you're now going to get a very interesting group structure. So how do the different agents see the deeper reality? So you will, I, I, I bet we'll see in some cases we can get a Lorentz transformation relating them or Euclidean transformation. So we will start to see how the different agents um, um, perceptions differ systematically as you change the agent. But the other thing that is interesting is that not only the we might call the spatial window, which particular subset of states you're using, but how many steps of the of the chain do you want to look at? Do you want to look at only 50 steps or 100 or a billion or a trillion? I mean, ultimately, Markov chains are supposed to go off to infinity. Um, you know, but 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 imagining finite temporal windows, it, it, and it turns out when you do that, what what each sub agent will see depends almost entirely on this temporal window as well as the spatial window. So when, when you have a, a very small temporal window, you will, um, and I can go into the mathematics of this, but what you will see with small temporal windows is, is what, what we believe will turn out to be um, bosons in physics. These are massless particles. So Don- and, and you'll see tons of bosons. So Don, the mathematical yeah. sites of it, right? The, the W represent the world. And then you got the perceive yes. the P, and then you got the A, the A, and then you got That's the right. measurable. Right. You got the measurable space between the experience, the X, and then the action, the G. So, what is that measurable right. experience that you're measuring, though? So, so what are those measurable spaces? Um, yeah. So, so those measurable spaces are are probability spaces. So, anytime that you have some kind of probabilistic uh, dynamics. You you need to have a, a probability space in which the dynamics can take place. And so that's the case with these Markovian dynamics. And what's interesting is I didn't think about that for the longest time. We, you know, it's just de rigueur that if you're going to write down a, you know, probability uh, 
then you have to write down a probability space. <laughs> and, and I didn't even think about what the probability so years later, but I realized that I was only focused on the experiences, but what about the probability space in which they occur? And I, in, it, it seems to me that a natural interpretation of the probability space itself is uh, to be interpreted as, as pure awareness without any particular content. Something that right. spiritual traditions have talked about for a long time. So here the is this verdict, pure awareness, which is the potential. Right? Uh, I'm sorry. Is it the verdict you're talking about the the the, the Indian uh, philosophy about the the observer position, the Ak the Akman go backward to uh, the Brahman? Is that the one that you're talking yeah. about? That 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 would be. Um, I, I think that's one example of it. I think all the different spiritual traditions point with their own words to the same kind of thing. And it, what was interesting to me was, I mean, I wasn't trying to model that. I I, I just was trying to do the math and I had to write down a probability space. And I, I didn't even think about it. And it was only years later that probability space. And the only interpretation that makes sense is something along the lines of this, this unbounded potential for experience, uh, namely awareness, a pure awareness without any particular content. Um, and, and then many spiritual traditions will then say, that is what you are. You are not the particular content, this particular body or this particular color that you're seeing or this particular headache that you're feeling. That's not what you are. Those are those are just experiences that are arising in this fundamental awareness. And, and you are that fundamental awareness, not just the things that arise. So, so Don, the end represent our, our selfhood, the observer position. That's where the end come in. In that triangle mathematic graph? Oh, the well, in the, the, the so the position, the, the perception, decision, action loop, and there's also a, 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 an integer n that we have there. That was simply just to um, a, a counter for the number of steps uh, of, the, of the Markovian internet. So you, you need a, a counter in some sense to say what, what step of the chain you're in. Um, so that, that was just a, a technical thing. It is, um, it's not time. It's just the 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 temper. It's just the sequence counter of the Markov chain. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um. So so I I end up basically at the same point uh, as Don. And let me let me walk it backwards towards the biology of where I think it comes from. Um. If if you didn't already know what it was to communicate with a human and somebody showed you a three pound uh, you know three and a half pound brain and they say so how many um. How many selves do you think you think are in there? Well, we'd have absolutely no idea because because a priori you don't really know what the density, you know, the the agential density of this material is. You have no idea. And and the mm -hmm. thing is that and and then of course in you know you you get to split brain patients and dissociative states. So we still actually it's it's still not super clear you know how to how to count these things. But but um, it's interesting that in biology every every cell is some other cell's neighbor. In fact, every cell, every cellular neighbor is some other cell's external environment. And so this question of, you know, what Don was saying of uh, different uh, different selves uh, sort of being uh, within a kind of a larger structure, this is almost guaranteed because, because it, it, there is no obvious and unambiguous way to say where any one self ends and, and any other self begins. And biology is always multi-scale and and every everything is made up, you know. So, so like Descartes was looking, he, he liked the pineal gland because there was just one of them. But one of what? If you look inside, it's full of cells. The thing's full of cells. There's not one of anything. And if you look inside the cells, guess what you find? You find a bunch of molecules. I mean, the, the, there really is no one of anything. Everything is made of sort of components. And and you really start to see this when you look at basic embryogenesis, which I think is super important here. It's this this journey that each of us took from being a an unfertilized oocyte, you know, this blob of chemicals into whatever it is that we are now. Let's just look at the early time points of this, right? So, so, so what happens is you have you have this uh, embryonic uh, blastoderm. So it's a flat in in in, in uh, mammals and birds. It's like this flat disc, and okay, fifty thousand cells or something. So you look at this thing, and we say, oh, look, there's that's an embryo. Now, what did you just count as an embryo? There's one of what? Well, there's fifty thousand cells. What is there one of? Well, there's one of if you put a particular lens on this thing and you say, I'm going to count the 
system that attempts to that that is going to use energy and attempt to build a particular structure. Basically, what I'm going to count is goal directed systems. I'm going to say um, how many different goal directed systems are there, and what you will find is that all of these cells will work together towards a particular anatomical goal. You can the other way to think about it, if you don't like goal talk, is that it's trying to reach a particular region of anatomical morphous space where you've got a couple eyes, you've got the right number of toes, all, all of that stuff. So. So a bunch of these cells get together and they're all going to work on this one construction project. Everybody agrees every step. This is what they're, this is what they're working on. Okay. So, so, so now you've counted one you say, well, there you go. That's a, that's a separate self. It's a separate consciousness. It's going to be a human embryo. Let's say we know what that looks like, except that uh, if you were to come along uh, at that early stage, and, and I've done this in avian um, with, with chicken uh, eggs and things like this. When I was a grad student, you take a little needle, and you make a couple of scratches in that blastoderm, eventually it's going to heal up, they're going to heal. But before they heal, what happens is that every group of cells that cannot feel the other cells because you put a scratch between them, decides that, well, it's just me then. And so they form an embryo and every island forms an embryo. And then when they heal, you have conjoined twins and or triplets or whatever. So the question of, so, so you look at an embryo uh, and you say, well, how many are in there? determined. It could be anywhere from zero to some small number of them, because that question is decided on the fly. It is not pre-programmed. It is decided on the fly by the physiology of, of a bunch of cells making a decision of how they're going to uh, um, coalesce towards one uh, uh, machine that's going to take this morphogenetic journey, this, this, this movement through anatomical morphospace. So what then what happens then is that you, 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 you realize that what you've got is you've got this almost like... Um, almost like this Freudian ocean of possibility, these 50,000 cells, and out of them might come some number of intelligences. And once you realize that that's the case, and that uh, within this one thing, there could be three different uh, conjoined twins, and this, of course, happens in, in humans as well as other animals, then you realize that, fine, the adult human body or any animal body also has within it various collection collectives, such as organs and various other things, that... Uh, for the exact same, and so, so I, I'll say, uh, I'll just back up and say that I don't have a theory of consciousness that I'm sort of uh, pro propagating, right? Like many other people do. I don't have my own. Maybe I will at some point. I don't now. So I don't have too much to say about consciousness except this. All, as far as I can tell, uh, all of the theories of consciousness that try to explain why brains are associated with consciousness in some way, for the exact same reason that all of those theories pick the brain to be able to do it. Pretty much every tissue in your body should be judged as conscious because all of these things that these theories talk about and and you know the the let's say the neuroscience theories you lean on things like well uh, they're, they're these integrated electrical networks and we've got some neurotransmitters and some ion channel all of this stuff exists all over your body i, I have yet to come across a a, a theory of consciousness that uh it tells you why the brain is different from anything else and, and when you sort of start to poke at it, you say, you know, they say, well, then it's it's the magnetic field of it. They say, okay, how about the magnetic field of the liver? Why, why is that different? Well, I guess it probably isn't. I mean, there's that, right? That's where you end up. There's just no, no one has drawn that line for a very good reason because neurons evolved from uh, systems that were other cell types that were using these electrical communications long before brain showed up. So for the same reason that you might uh, now consciousness, it's not going to be verbal consciousness. You're not going to talk to it. Um, uh, using uh, uh, you know, using language, and you're probably not aware of it any more than you are aware of your your other nonverbal hemisphere and the opinions that it has that that you don't even know about. But so you're not aware of it. But but it's entirely plausible given the developmental biology that we are these these nested hierarchies of diverse conscious agents that are all having experiences and solving problems in different spaces, all kinds of weird spaces. So, so transcriptional, so gene expression spaces, um, metabolic spaces, physiological spaces, anatomical spaces. We love the three-dimensional, you know, sort of space of the, where it's easy for us to recognize intelligence, but, but that's just, that's just our own, our own limitation. Um, if you had a, you know, just imagine, imagine that, that you had a, uh, a primary sense of your own blood chemistry instead of, you know, in addition to your, to your retina that looks outwards for medium sized objects moving at medium speeds, you would also have an internal sensor of your blood chemistry and you could feel it. You would have no problem recognizing your liver as extremely intelligent because it would be solving all these problems on a daily basis. And you would know, you would feel it. I mean, at the same way that we see, oh, look, that crow and that, uh, you know, octopus, look at the amazing things they're doing. You would see your liver doing that stuff every day. If you had 
if you had the perception of this other space. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and we can build things, right? So, so at some point we'll talk about synthetic uh, beings and, and, and we can build things that will have um, consciousness in those spaces. But so, so I end up exactly where, where Don ends up. I think that we, we are um, these nested hierarchies of, uh, of consciousnesses. Only some of them are verbal. Uh, only some of them do we have any direct uh, connection to, but they're all over the place and we're bad at recognizing them. And, and, and that's why we need to, you know, we need to think about these things more. Don? Brilliant. Uh, that's, that's brilliant, Mike. And I, I agree. I'll, I'll, I'm definitely not the biologist that, that Mike is, but I'll just throw in another simple biology example to support what he's saying. And that is you know, with split brain patients, right? We, um, so, so people who um, have, intractable epilepsy uh, that can't be treated with normal drugs um, were in extreme cases where they were their lives were on the line um, submitted to a surgery called a a colostomy surgery where they would uh, Joe Bogan who was a friend of mine would actually take a scalpel and go in there and cut the corpus callosum which was a band of about 220 million fibers that connect the right and left hemispheres of the brain and um, it was a success. If, if the epileptic focus was on the right hemisphere, you would spare the left hemisphere from getting bothered by an epileptic seizure. And so it was, it was a clinical success. But, but then some other friends of mine and, and, and other researchers um, started to study, you know, what's different about these people that have their, their brains cut in half. And, and Mike Zaniga and many others but, uh, you know, did this. A friend of mine, uh, Ramakandran, V.S. Ramakandran at, uh, at UC San Diego, friends call him Rama. So I'll just, what Rama did was he, he found some, one patient in which the right hemisphere, I, I believe, um, was an atheist and the left hemisphere believed in God. Right? So, so here, and, and another case was found in which the right hemisphere wanted to be a race car driver and the left hemisphere wanted to have a desk job. Yep. So, so you have... Uh, you know, those are as different uh, a personality as you could as you could possibly want, stuck inside one cranium, and and so that raises the question: Here I am with my corpus callosum intact, and why is it that on Friday night a battle going on about what I want? You know, maybe one part of me says, "Let's go out and have fun," the other part says, "No, I've got a book I want to read." Well, well, maybe there are two people in there, and they really want to do two different things on Friday night. And uh, I do have to negotiate a- among them. And so who, who is the I now that is doing the negotiation among those two people? So the whole notion of a self then becomes really interesting and, and, and very problematic. And so I agree completely with Mike uh, on that. And, and again, the, a, a big issue here is we're only seeing things through a space-time interface, right? And so um, it's not like, for example, the distinction we make between living and non-living or conscious and, and unconscious is a principal distinction. Right? So, so for, just to, to get at what I'm talking about here, I'm looking at, 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 at all of you on a Zoom screen. See, I'm looking at Mike right now on the Zoom screen. And, and some of the pixels are pixels for Mike's face. And when I look at those pixels, I'm getting a, a, a portal into Mike's consciousness. I, I can tell if he's interested. I can tell if he's bored. I can tell, like, I, can, I get some insight into his consciousness. But there are other pixels of a floor, for example, and the back of his chair. And those pixels are not giving me any insight about consciousness. Now, should I say that some pixels are conscious and other pixels on my Zoom screen are not conscious? Well, that, that's stupid. Pixels are pixels. They're not conscious or unconscious. Some of them are giving me a portal into Mike's consciousness and others are not. So this is not, so the same thing is true of space and time and what we call physical objects. There is the distinction we make between, oh, that's alive and that's dead or that's conscious and that's not conscious is the same mistake as saying, oh, those are, those are conscious pixels and those are unconscious pixels on my Zoom screen. It's exactly the same mistake. An interface is just an interface. It's not the truth. So, so it's not a principal distinction between living and non-living. It's an artifact of the limitations of our interface that we're mistaking for an insight into the nature of reality. It's a rookie mistake. So we have to get past the rookie mistake of saying that the uh, distinctions that we see in our interface are th- therefore necessarily true in reality. Sorry, I just want to add one one funny. Uh, well, I don't know if it's funny, but but a story of a, a kind of a troubling uh, story 
that that goes with with Don's point about having two different opinions uh, in in your in your brain. And uh, so so I read this. Uh, this was a um, a description of a uh, a therapist, a, a psychiatrist that had this experience. So so this guy, this patient comes in and he says, "I've got some sort of uh, dissociative disorder where I've got the, there's a personality in there that." Uh, he's a real partier and and I like to work and and he disturb you know I can't I can't work anymore because sometimes he comes out and screws up you know he acts uh, you know acts like a fool at work and whatever we, we we need to take care of this and so you know they start doing some sort of I don't even know how they do it but some sort of integrative therapy and they're gonna so so he, one day one day the patient walks in and it's the other guy and he says hey what's this I hear about integrating integrate what what, what are you guys doing and the do- and the doctor says well you know we're gonna um, uh, integrate you. And he says, excuse me, you're going to integrate me and who's going to be left? He says, well, you know, you'll be well, at, you'll do well at work. And when I was, wait a minute, wait a minute, where am I going to be? And he's, and the doc's like, well, you're kind of going to be gone, I hope, if, you know, if we do our, and he says, are you kidding? What, well, what happened to the Hippocratic Oath? What do you mean I'm going to be gone? I don't want to be gone. Yeah, I should be gone. I, you know, he's a boring, you know, he's boring. I, I've got the fun life to, to make him gone. What, what am I going to be gone for? And so, and right. So, so just put yourself in that, in that place. Right. I mean, presumably the other, you know, the other personality signs the the checks and everything, but, 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 but you're faced with a coherent, this isn't some weird tick or reflex. This is a coherent being that is making an argument that knows what, what a Hippocratic oath is and is making an argument (laughs) that whatever, that whatever you're doing is going to erase them from the world by sort of somehow jamming you down into this into this integrated personality that can spend tw- you know 12 hours at work and and not have any fun. So that's I mean that's a super you know it's a it's a super yeah. disturbing sort of kind of you know way way to think about this because yeah we there are no as, as far as I know there are no indivisible beings. We are all made of parts that that's just how it has to be and therefore w- w- there is the possibility of that that magical, which I think, if anything is magical, this is it. It's this, this, this um, uh, process by which, by which, uh, merge into a larger scale collective, you know, self or individual. That that process is going to have failure modes. Some of them temporary, some of them permanent. And and it's these failure modes that really give us uh, something to think about in terms of what are mm-hmm. we and who are we and, and and how we relate to each other. Fabulous! Fabulous! Yeah, we recently have McGill Chris. Ian McGill Chris came to our club um, last Monday. Yeah, he has book um, the matter with things. Yeah, he talk about the the left and right hemisphere hypothesis a lot in his book on his the volume one. Yeah, we're gonna quickly move on before because Mike got to go um, pretty soon, probably about thirty minutes time. But but Don, you can stay with us for another hours, right? So that. I'm going to go straight to the the last question. So these conscious agents, the common factor, Don, so all these mul- multiplicity and diversity of conscious agents. So how many of them? So they're all going towards one field of consciousness. Is that what it is? Can you speak on that? Quickly? Right. So, so there's... Um... It's, it's quite interesting. Suppose I start off with a countable infinity of conscious agents. So there's agent one, two, three, four, all the way up to countable infinity. Then uh, any combination of any subset of them, so agent one and two, agent one, two, and three, whatever, that, that also is a conscious agent. That's a theorem of the math that uh, any collection of conscious agents is also a conscious agent. So that means that I started off with a countable infinity of conscious agents. I, I can take the power set, what, what the mathematicians, mathematicians call the power set, that's the number of new conscious agents that come from combination. Well, that's a higher level of infinity. That's, um, you know, ALF1. And now with that new set of agents, I can take their power set. Yeah, so now I'm at ALF2 conscious agent. So now I'm marching my way up Cantor's hierarchy of infinities, and there's no end to that hierarchy of infinities. So. So it's a, it's a theorem that there is just one, and it's also uh, a fact that I'll never be able to get there, which is, I guess, again, also in line with the spiritual traditions, right? That, that they, they say that anything that we can say about it, like the Buddhists will say, a finger pointing to the moon um, is not the moon, it's just a finger pointing. And so that will be true of our scientific descriptions as well. We, we have to recognize that the scientific destructions are, are uh, scientific um, 
theories are merely um, pointers and they're not the reality. And in this case, what's, what's nice about the scientific pointers is that they tell you that they're not the reality. They tell you that they are limited. And that's what's beautiful about the scientific pointers. Like the Einstein's theory of space-time and with quantum field theory tells us that that pointer, that space-time idea, um, fails at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's where the pointer stops and the moon begins, <laughs> right? Whatever is beyond begins. And so, so the conscious agent theory has the same nice property. It, it says, basically, there is one conscious agent and I can't describe it. I can I can go to a left zero. I can go maybe to go to a left one. Uh, uh, of course, even then I'll fail because I don't have a supercomputer that can do it. So and I don't have enough paper to do it. So already you can see that that um, is telling you this is a pointer and the reality is going to transcend the, the pointer completely. Absolutely. Mike, did you agree in that, Mike? Um, that all pointed to one or you're still keen on your panpsychism? I I think I think both. Uh, I think they're not uh, uh, mutually exclusive. I think that th there are. I mean, to 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 me, uh, recognizing agency and consciousness in the world around you is a lens that you bring to the process, like any other. And so, if you if you have a way of recognizing uh, intelligence in components. Of something that's great and then you may have uh you may also observe that the whole thing is so 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 just to give an example we recently um uh, there's this there's this mathematical notion of a gene regulatory network it's very simple it's a, it's a collection of nodes let's say a dozen of uh, these nodes and you're just going to write down how each one uh, up or down regulates some other. So it's this like little network and you can, you know, people have been like Stu Kaufman, um, Kaufman has been studying this for a long time. And you can run, you can view them as, as um, uh, 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 dynamical systems and, and see what they do and so on. So you look at this thing and you say, well, okay, it's very simple. I can see all the parts. There's nowhere to hide here. This is like the rock bottom of, deterministic, uh, z z you know, zero agency mechanical system. There's just nothing there. So we took the hypothesis. So, so my view always is that you can't just make these pronouncements from a, from an armchair. You have to do experiments. So we said, okay, what if we just, what if, what if we test the hypothesis that this thing has some degree of, 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 of cognitive, of cognitive ability. So what we, what we ended up doing was testing their learning capacity in the following in the following way we we assign some uh, one of the nodes as a conditioned stimulus another node as an unconditioned stimulus and pick some other node as a, as the re, as the uh, response and then we do things like pavlovian conditioning we tw you know we twiddle two of them simultaneously and we look at what happens anyway you get the idea so so we now have a couple of papers on this that biological networks and not so much random networks so i think evolution likes this because biological networks do this more than random ones do biological networks show six different kinds of learning uh, including associative conditioning in this in this dirt simple system, and that's with no with no changing of the network structure. So we're not changing the synaptic weights. We're not rearranging the network. None of that. This is purely purely dynamical system stuff. But 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 there is a lens. So there are two diff two competing lenses on the same phenomenon. One is the standard molecular biology lens. This thing is dumb as a rock. And what you if you're going to change the way it works, let's say for biomedical purposes. Your only hope is bottom-up rewiring. You need to add nodes, subtract nodes, you know, genomic editing to change the, the way that these nodes interact with each other. That's your only hope. There's another lens which makes a completely different uh, prediction, and if you, which is that which is that actually, if you treat, if you don't rewire anything, but you treat this thing as a minimally cognitive agent that that can be uh, manipulated by experiences, by stimuli, by training, then you can do some more stuff, and then you can look at these two lenses and say gee, this one tells us a lot that we can use in biomedicine that we're actually not getting out of here, right? So, so, so you can have multiple perspectives. They have different powers in terms of what they let you do in the real world. Maybe someday somebody else will come along and say, ah, you're both wrong. Here's a much better lens. You know, fine. That's how it goes. So, so then, so then that, that allows you to, to have it all. You can, you look at a human body and you say, I'm looking really deep and I see some components that clearly have their own thing going on. But of course, so does the organ that they sit in, and because because that has certain certain interesting capabilities in in physiological space, and then the whole thing that we're going to call a human, well, that's a bigger intelligence that can do other things in behavioral space, maybe linguistic space. So I uh, I see it both ways. I think I think the merging is 
is is correct. I think Don's totally right about all of that. But I also think that there are useful lenses that allow you to exploit a panpsychist view. And just to be clear, you know, the, the, the there's a couple of different versions of panpsychism. The one where the one where you take a perfectly good physics and then paint some hopes and dreams on all the electrons. I, that's not the, that's not the one, right? So people correctly make fun of that one because that's just not going to give you anything. There's a different, however, research program which 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 Don and people like Chris Fields and Carl Friston and other people are doing, which is to reformulate physics from the, the the cognitive perspective. So it's not that we have a perfectly good physics and now we're going to paint some extra junk on it. No, it's that actually what we have been taking as physics is a, um, I don't know what the right uh, word for it, but, but it's a, it's a, it's an oversimplification and a, not a really, gr not, not the best lens. I mean, it's done well in many areas, but it's not the best lens. And you can formulate a different lens where things like active inference and and some of these other extremely general things and i don't pretend to be any kind of expert on on active inference but 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 i understand the research program it helps you understand inanimate things and interactions between living things and non-living things from the same with the same lens and i think that's super powerful and and so i think you can have a useful version of panpsychism where you scale down your cognitive expectations it's not that the rocks have hopes and dreams like humans that's not the point the point is that you can use the same tools, including, um, you know, active inference and some other, and, and, and trainability and some other things to understand both physical processes and then eventually, um, uh, you know, advanced cognitive properties, maybe social phenomena, who knows? Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's a, that's a long answer to, to, to your question. Thank you. Ryan. So how many conscious agents then to make a photon, Don? That's a question from the audience. Uh, so... <clears throat> That's what we're going to be working on, on on our very next paper. We're calling it tentatively titled "Traces of Consciousness" um, paper, and and the idea is that um, I was talking about these trace chains, right? You have a big dynamical system of conscious agent, a big agent, but I can look at the two to the n subagents and and do a trace chain on each one of those, and I can change the temporal window, and so I, I should say just a little bit of background about what what motivates what i'm about to tell you so so in the paper that we just published last week we, we proved that the markov chains map onto decorated permutations I, I mentioned that earlier decorated permutations and the decorated permutations the physicists have shown are the deepest structure they found behind space-time and with decorated permutations you can then um, create things like the amplitudehedron and compute scattering amplitudes, like two gluons uh, smashing into each other and four gluons go spraying out. So you, you actually, you can compute all of the scattering amplitudes, <laughs> truly, if you just have these decorated permutations and maybe momentum and spin data as well. And so when we made this mapping from our Markov dynamics onto decorated permutations and decorated permutations into space time, that gave us the clue there's a particular aspect of our dynamics of conscious agents that's critical for the physics and the mapping of the physics. And it's called the communicating classes. So that's that's the key thing. These are they're so called. So if you look at Markov chains on online, you can see what the communicating classes are. It's, it's a standard part of Markov chains. So our our hypothesis, the, the one that I'm working on right now, is that the so-called entropy rate, this is a technical term in Markov chain, so if you, you can look it up online as well, entropy rate of a communicating class is what corresponds to mass in space-time. Okay, so particles in space-time are projections of communicating classes, but most communicating classes project to things far more interesting than particles. But particles are projections of communicating classes. And for those communicating classes that project to particles, it's the entropy rate that is their mass. So when you look at what I technically what I just said, it means that if the Markovian dynamics, if the Markov kernel has only zeros and ones in in the matrix, then it will project to a massless particle like a photon. So now I'm getting to your question about photons. You can see why I had to spend some time, right? The, the zero entropy rate communicating classes project to massless particles, or I should say massless particles, the, the better way to say it is massless particles are the projection of zero communicating 
uh, zero entry rate communicating classes because communicating classes don't necessarily project to particles. They can project to more interesting things than particles. Particles are the simplest. So, so that means, so, so now we want to find out exactly which specific, um, th there are lots of different kinds of Markovian kernels that are, that have zero entropy rate. Um, some of them are, for example, are, um, derangements. So they're, they're, they're permutations called de derangements. And there are other kinds that have combinations of derangements as well as uh, absorbing states. So we want to look at those and, and then figure out, okay, which correspond to like photons, but photons are not the only kind of bosons. There is also gluons, there are W particles and Z particles, and then there's the Higgs. So there's a, a, a number of, of massless particles. And so, so we'll, we'll, we'll want to get this dictionary um, for between the particular kinds of um, permutation matrices that, and, and which ones mapped to which, which massless particles. So, so that, that, that you can see that uh, there's a lot of fun work ahead, um, but it's a deep technical question. Looking forward to it, Don. So we're going to open up the floor for Q and A. We have on the stage waiting to ask both of you some questions. So we're going to open it up now. Uh, we have Prakash. Yes, greetings. Uh, fantastic talk, good conversation. I was just curious. Um, you know, look at looking at living systems. I always wonder where would you put plants in this picture? You know. Plants are living agents. They don't seem to have neurons, but they have the same cellular space. I was just wondering what you would have to share about what do you think about plants? Um, yeah, who's well, who's the question to it? Prakash, is it to to both? Uh, Mike makes sense. Yeah, we, we can, <laughs> yeah, they make sense. They for have Mike. to break out the model. <laughs> yeah, to both. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mike. Would you um, want to go first, Mike? Sure, sure. Um, well, I can two two things. One is uh, so so there certainly are people who study this question of plant intelligence. Uh, there have been some some nice papers on that. Um, people like uh, Frantisek Balushka and, and and some other folks um, uh, really really talk about uh, plant uh, plant cognition and plant intelligence. Um, from my perspective. Plants are not nearly weird enough as a challenging example for all of this kind of stuff. I mean, I and, and other people, of course, spend time thinking about really minimal models compared to which plants are a no-brainer. Pardon the pun for uh, for for having uh, for having cognitive um, capacities, including an, an anticipation and memory and and learning and and you know creative problem solving and various things. Plant plants do all of that. Uh, so so yeah, I have I have I have zero. The, the fact that they don't have neurons means almost nothing to me. I th to, I think um, as as we think about the wide universe, I, I find it impossible to believe that the only things that have uh, cognition are things with actual neurons like we have. I mean, that seems like just a, an incredibly implausible uh, view to me. Uh, and uh, we came from uh, you know a, a lot of electrophysiology was done in bacteria anyway. I mean, neurons. You know they do some interesting things, but but this is this is way wider than that. So so yeah, no no problem with with plants. Well, I, I I agree with Mike, and I, I I think he said it well. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we're going to move on to Andy. Hey, thank you both for being here. This is fascinating. Thank you, Ivy and John, for making this happen. Um, it's hard to decide what to drill into. I, I would like to drill into this idea of. Um, the uh the simulations this, so this is for 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 don um the simulations that that you claim prove that perception of truth leads to extinction um so i wanted to drill in this idea of truth a little bit like what do you mean by truth versus fitness it seems like fitness is a sort of truth um for a biological system and can you give an example of the perception like like a true perception of a thing leading to less fitness than a false perception and or a false perception of a thing leading to more fitness than a true perception of a thing um and you know and finally uh isn't results say more about the simulation and how it's built and the built-in approximations and assumptions and biases um that are built into it than than it then it's then then it says about reality. Thank you. 
Yeah, great question. So, so I'll, I'll first just give you, you asked for a, a, an intuitive example that would might help understand why not knowing the truth could help you out. Uh, I'll just give an intuitive example. You know, in virtual reality, say again, Grand Theft Auto, you're, you're, you're trying to race against a bunch of friends. You know, you've you got your car and you're racing a Porsche and a, and a Maserati and so forth. And what are you really doing in reality in, in, in this metaphor? What you're really doing to win the game is you're toggling millions of voltages per second in a precise order. That's what you're doing to try to win the game. And that's the, that in this metaphor, that's the reality. What you're doing, what, what you know about what you're doing is you're turning a steering wheel and you're pushing on a gas pedal. A lot, lot simpler than toggling a million voltages per second in a precise order. So now if, if you said, well, Cal, I want to know the truth and I'm going to try to play the game knowing the truth. I'm going to actually toggle the million voltages per second um, to try to win. So that would, I, I can guarantee you the person who's trying to toggle those voltages as fast as they can would lose against someone who is just turning a steering wheel and pushing on the gas. And that's, that's the top level intuition why evolution hid the truth from our eyes is because uh, if you had to actually toggle all of reality, uh, you would die in the process. Better to give you just a user interface that, that hides most of that from you. So that's the intuition. But, but the, now for the math, we, we did simulations to begin with just to check to see what would happen. And, and once we found that uh, organisms that saw reality were, were, were going extinct, we then let go of the simulations, we went to the math. So I went to a mathematician. So we now have theorems. So it's not, we're not relying on simulations at all. We're, we have theorems. And the theorems are using the tools of evolutionary game theory. And in evolutionary game theory, the key technical notion are fitness payoff functions. The domain of that function includes whatever objective reality might be. Evolutionary game theory doesn't tell you what objective reality is. It just says there is some objective reality. Um, it, include, it could include organisms, their states, their actions, and, and, and so forth. Um, and then, it, so there's this fitness payoff that includes whatever objective reality is in the domain of the function, and the range of the function are the possible payoff values, say from zero to 100. Zero means very, very bad. 100 means wonderful, wonderful payoff, say. And you can ask a clean technical question. What is the probability that a generically chosen payoff function will be a homomorphism of some structure in the objective reality, like a, a total order in objective reality or, or a, a, you know, a measurable structure or a topology or whatever it might be? What, in other words, what is the probability that a fitness payoff function will actually have information about structures in objective reality, right? Because if it doesn't have information about the structures, how can it tune you to the structures in objective reality? So, so the, we ask the technical question, do fitness payoff functions generically contain information about st structures in objective reality? And we, we, if, if you want to see the math, um, you can Google our papers called Fact, Fiction, and Fitness. So that's the paper where we go through the math. And what you know, Chaitan is the mathematician, not Don Hoffman. <laughs> Chaitan is the mathematician, um, but of course we collaborate on it. And what, what, what we prove is that uh, for, for several different structures, but you, when you see the trend, you realize it's true basically for all structures. The probability is zero, precisely zero, that a generically chosen payoff function um, will have any information about objective reality, about any structure in objective reality. So there's, there's nothing in the pay, fitness payoff functions to tune you to objective reality. Now, I'll, I'll just mention a couple quick objections that people say. One, one objection that um, 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 made uh, in, in Synthase sin, sin, sin recently um, is, look, um, you're using evolutionary game theory. So either you believe that evolution, the math of evolutionary game theory um, um, models biological evolution correctly, or you don't believe it does. And if you do believe it models biological evolution correctly, well, biological evolution assumes that there are physical objects like organisms in space and time and resources. So, and if you don't believe that, so, so, so if you're going to use evolution or game theory to say that there are such, no such things as physical objects in space, time and fundamental reality, then that would be contradicted. You'd be contradicting yourself because the math, you're, you're claiming the math 
faithfully models the physical biology. And if you don't think the math of evolutionary game theory models the physical biology, then you shouldn't use it anyway because you didn't think it models. So, so either way, you're stuck in a logical contradiction. That, what, that's sort of his argument. And what that argument misses is how science works. So, so take um, Einstein's theory of space-time quant and, and quantum field theory. So these, these theories assume their mathematical theories are built on the assumption that space-time is fundamental. Right, so Einstein's special relativity and quantum field theory, those mathematical, those assume that space-time is fundamental. So you could use the same argument. So, uh, but, but, but notice what the phys physicists do is they say, our theories tell us that space-time is doomed. Space-time is not fundamental. Okay, well, okay, so I'll use the same uh, got you logical argument. Well, so either Einstein's math modeled his intuitions in, in, in which case it, it could not possibly show that space-time is doomed, or it didn't model his intuitions, in which case you couldn't use it. You shouldn't use it to show that space-time is doomed. Well, no physicist would take that seriously. That's a, that's a silly argument. Here's what really goes on in science. Every scientific theory makes assumptions, and there is no theory of everything. There is no such thing as a scientific theory of everything. So a good scientific theory starts with assumptions and basic concepts, but a good scientific theory will tell you the limits of those concepts. Einstein's theory with quantum field theory tells us the limits of his basic concepts, namely 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds, you fall apart. So what we're doing is exactly the same thing, but with evolutionary theory. The assumptions of that, sure, Darwin thought about physical objects in space and time. Absolutely. What are the limits of those concepts? Well, evolutionary game theory is the mathematics. And that mathematics is precise enough to tell us the limits of the basic concepts, just like Einstein's theory of relativity is, is good enough to tell us the, the limitations of, of Einstein's notion of space and time or, or space time. So this is the way science works. It's not a self-refutation. To, to think that is actually to misunderstand fundamentally the nature of scientific progress. Now, what you can't do is to use the old theory to tell you what's next, right? So Einstein's theory tells us space-time is doomed, but it can't tell you where's the next step beyond space-time. It can't do that. And similarly, the theory of evolution by natural selection with the mathematics of evolutionary game theory tells you, aha, the notions of organisms in space and time is not fundamental. But does it tell you, okay, what is more fundamental? No, it doesn't tell you what's more fundamental. So that's where then scientists have to make a creative leap. And that and physicists have done this just in the last 10 years. They just they went outside space time, they found the amplitude hedron, they found decorated permutations. They, that's a creative leap, but then you, what you do is you show how they project back into space-time, right? You have to go back and get your, your previous theories as a special case of the more general framework. And so we have to do the same thing. Our theory of conscious agents is a leap beyond evolutionary theory, but we have to show how it projects back into space and time and gives us back evolutionary theory as a special case. So, so, so I'm answering your question, but I also want to answer another question that has just been published in Synthase, you know, a, a philosophy journal recently. This, and I just want to point out that that, that argument it just falls flat very easily. <laughs> I'll stop. Thank you. Can we move on? Uh, we have um, Leman. Leman, did you want to ask questions? Uh, were you uh, well, were, were you talking about me, Ivy? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, hi, Donald. We've corresponded before. I think I'm <laughs> probably your, one of your, your biggest uh, fans on Clubhouse here. I was wondering if you had had um, any uh, correspondence with Nima Arkani Hamad, because I know that um, you're following what they're doing in high energy physics really closely. And a lot of people have been, you know, begging Nima to you know, uh, write a book that's, you know, more understandable for the general public, because I'm fascinated with the, uh, you know, decorated permutations and the amplitude hedron, but it's so far over my head. Uh, could you provide any resources on how to really get a grasp on, on what that means? 
Right. So I, I would love to talk with Nemo. I, I haven't yet. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to actually get to a place where um, I'll be worth his time. So I'm, I'm trying to, you know, the work I'm doing on these trace chains and so forth, the decorated permutations stuff and the map mark of chains onto it, I think already might be of interest to him, but I want to push this a little bit further. He, he, his time is very valuable. When I talk to him, I'd like, if I get the chance to talk to him, I'd like to really um, have something that'll be of interest to him. But if you want to see um, a more details, a little bit more accessible about the amplitude hedron and the decorated permutations is course at Harvard that he gave in the fall of 2019. So if you Google uh, Nima Arkani Hamed Harvard Lecture One, you will find on YouTube, they, they posted all 20 something, 25, 20, whatever it is, lectures. So uh, Nima Arkani Hamed Harvard Lecture One, you'll see that he has an introductory lecture um, and he really lays it out in the introductory lecture. Um, he tries to be fairly non-technical. Um, it's for a graduate class at Harvard, so you know, non-technical for them might be technical for for the rest of us. But it's it's fairly accessible, and that's probably I would say his class and all the lectures are online. That's maybe the most accessible source you're going to find right now is his Harvard lectures. Um, and I've I've studied I. His, I've been studying his lectures. I've actually transcribed um, 15 of them. All his first 15 lectures, I've transcribed myself personally, equation by equation, figure by figure. I, I did that until COVID stopped me. I, I, I COVID took me out, uh, and so. But I plan to get back to it now. I'm starting to recover from COVID and um, go back to it. But so, but yeah, I'm I'm really trying to study NEMA stuff. And um, you know, I'm not a physicist. I work with physicists, and at some point, we would love to talk with them. Thank you. Can we move on to Willie? Wonderful. Thank you, Ivy. And thank you to have uh, this great minds in the same room and uh, watching your convergence at some point. And uh, I have two questions for each of you. One question. And it's definitely fascinating what you are doing, uh, Donald. And uh, I say at the first thing that great chumps in science are often in company of a big flock of people who don't understand what the new perspective is. So I'm also confused sometimes by uh, the combination of metaphors and mathematical apparatus uh, and all this. Uh, and it's in the making, definitely. And uh, I will take for granted that you imply kind of anti-realism with your stance. Um, and I don't want to discuss it. Uh, what I want to see, if I get it right, is that you are letting go uh, reality and space time in a way, yeah, and starting with the fundamental of the conscious age. And we ha had a reading room here uh, with these wonderful people uh, from the 2014 article, The Origin of Time in Conscious Agents, and we found that it's uh, a bit hard to define or to go with you what you mean. And um, I, it reminded me of the Phlogiston story, which is famous from Thomas S. Kuhn uh, about the structure of revolution and Occam's razor and so on. Uh, and we found out that we don't need Phlogiston to understand that um, uh, heat is flowing from a hot point to a cold point. And so we let go Phlogiston. And I wonder how can be in the same way let go reality and space time uh, does it really make sense what are the practical and theoretical consequences in science and in life and uh, closing here for your question uh, the old Leibniz introduced monads in the same way as atomism just cannot deliver the mantle yeah this was his basic intuition it cannot deliver emergent theories uh, theories of emergence or, or combination or composition just uh, does not suffice to make us understand how this should ever work. So I understand to go back to uh, the primacy of the mind, definitely. Yeah. But what are the predictions? Is it detectable? Are you working on a kind of uh, operational and kind of a detector, so to speak, that you can say, now we can hear, really see that he is a conscious agent. Uh, sorry, it's in space-time somehow, but we can detect it, and then we can count it just as 
as an example. And then we can even see how they emerge together or, or cooperate together and let time emerge. Something like this would be very ambitious, of course. And uh, I, should I go to Michael or should I just wait for you? My because yeah. We'll really yeah. go to Michael first because Michael got to leave in about yeah, five minutes. Sure. Time, and so it's shorter, shorter. Yeah, uh, to succinctly ask your questions. Yeah. So uh, for me, also you, uh, contrary to what Descartes was doing, Descartes tortured cats saying that are not uh, sentient beings, they are just machines, don't, don't worry. And now we have inflation of consciousness and inflation of conscious ancients, contrary, for instance, to even Thompson, who is preferring biopsychism, psychism, to panpsychism, only biological stuff, like maybe even plants, might have consciousness. And, and now my question is, um, because you are also coming from uh, theories of process structure, like autopoiesis in a way, but I guess you're going in a different uh, direction. You're going into this bioelectricity pattern. And here's my question. Are you looking for a substrate where the self then is emergent? Because you're using the term emergent and have a different as a, you have a different ontology, at, uh, contrary to, to Don, because you are starting uh, quite uh, with common sense that you are observing nature like Aristotle, Newton, Galileo, and so on. And then from this on, you, you uh, are constructing theories. And um, yeah, you say, I start with reality in a way, or do I get you wrong? And the last thing, and this is again to both of you, are you actually waiting for a new physics which might be even um, produced by Donald. Yeah, this is very exciting uh, because maybe uh, th this, this comes together. So thank you for both of you for your answer. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm not sure um, I, I will be able to hit all of that, but uh, but I'll try. I'll try to get to, to some of it. Um, the f the first thing I should say is that I'm I'm in a in an enjoyable uh, position here where. Uh, for, uh, I'm of, uh, on this on this panel. Uh, I am not. Uh, I'm not the most uh, sort of uh, uh, avant-garde uh, person here. So 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 Don has gone sort of further. My my stuff is a little more um, um, a little more mundane. I don't. I have not really said anything about consciousness. Um, I don't know anything about any new physics. I, I'm, you know, that's I haven't I haven't really gone there. Although I'm I'm in complete agreement with 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 Don's view of it and the, where he's going with it. I have a sl somewhat less uh, less ambitious thing, which is that uh, I'm interested in cognition. Cognition is not the same as consciousness. Uh, cognition is, uh, and and I uh, have the you know I sort of. Yeah, get into this in, in excruciating detail in this last the tame paper uh what 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 exactly i mean by by cognition but um to address your your fir your first point uh i do i do think that uh there's way more of it not less of it than uh than than for example descartes might have thought i think it's actually uh extremely prevalent in the in the in the universe i don't think it uh is limited to things that we would call alive I'm actually not sure what we mean by alive necessarily, and I don't spend any time trying to figure out what this category is. Other people do, and that's great. I spend all of my time thinking about cognition, not life, because I think there are many things that uh, uh, are um, importantly cognitive that uh, we would may or may not call life. And uh, with that, so, so that's A. And and I have this, uh, and and B is that I have this um, functional framework. It's called TAME, which is technological approach to mind everywhere. Uh, that basically it's it's a very engineery uh, kind of uh, approach that seeks to show you what exactly are the practical benefits of broad cognitive lens. So it's very important to me that this is not just philosophy. That this is these these all of these views are supposed to drive new discoveries, new research programs, new. So 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 half of my lab takes this stuff and turns it into interventions for biomedicine, for cancer, for whatever. Because this is not just supposed to be. Well, you can look at it this way, or you can Occam's razor it and you know just sort of do the science. No, that's actually not true. These the, this way of thinking about this gives rise to new experiments and new capabilities that we didn't have before. So um, and and maybe at some point co consciousness will be folded into that. I haven't done that yet, and so I make no no claims whatsoever about consciousness yet. Um, but uh, but 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 I do think that uh, uh, that uh, this 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 view of um, 
ba- basically basically tr- dropping our teleophobia. We've got this. We got this. We've developed uh, through through uh, the early stages of science this really weird fear of talking about goals and 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 the systems that pursue goals. And I think we need to dump that. I think that leaves uh, so much on the table when we pretend that doesn't exist. Uh, since this is the the 40s and cybernetics, we've had good theories of of how you can have non magical goal pursuing um, systems. So I think it's time to kind of give up our fear of that. And 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 once you do that, uh, really interesting examples of uh, novel research programs come come to light. And bioelectricity, you know, I, th- I think you mentioned bioelectricity. So so bioelectricity happens to be my favorite kind of cognitive glue for um, cells into larger systems, but it is not the only one. I don't think it's magic. I don't think it's the only game in town. I'm sure there are other mechanisms that uh, play the same functional roles and who knows other places in the universe what substrates um, uh, uh, play that role. But here on Earth, what evolution has done is really exploited bioelectricity and shown us how you can use uh, certain f- features of physics and, and computation to scale up cognition from very primitive goals of homeostatic little, you know, tiny systems all the way up through human level, massive cognitive light cones. So, so, so I love bioelectricity, but it is certainly not the only game in town for that. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Can we give a massive thank you to Professor Levin because Professor Levin would have to leave now. So, um, a massive thank you to Professor Levin, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, great to see you, Don. Um, awesome to be able to discuss this. And thanks, everybody. Thank you for your questions. Great to see you, Mike. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye. So, so right. I'll respond to the question as, as, as well. So um, for, first, the notion of reality, I, I would distinguish two kinds of reality. Um, you might say something is real if it it exists even if no one perceives it. That would be what you might call objective reality. Um, but that wouldn't apply to my headache. So suppose I have a headache. Well, that headache um, sure seems real to me, but it would would not exist without someone perceiving it, right? So, so the notion of objective reality doesn't seem to catch my headache, and if you told me my headache wasn't real, I'd be very cross with you. I mean, it, it's it's real to me. So I'll distinguish between objective objective reality versus subjective reality in, in that sense. And, and then what I'm saying is that um, we thought that space, time, and physical objects like the sun and the moon are objective reality. And all I'm saying is, no, they're a different kind of reality. They're subjective reality. They're, we, we thought that they were objective reality, but no, they're subjective reality. And I think quantum theory the, the Nobel Prize in physics last month was awarded to three researchers who have done empirical work showing that um, local realism is false. And basically, I'm saying what I'm saying is local realism is false. These things are all subjectively real. They're, they're there when you observe. Those properties are there when you observe, and they're not there when you don't observe. So they're, they're, they're subjectively real, but not objectively real. So now in terms of Leibniz, yeah, Leibniz, brilliant work in the monadology and um, you know he had the the analogy of the mill where he understood the hard problem of consciousness and dismissed it in one paragraph he he knew that you couldn't boot up consciousness from physical systems and it was so obvious to him he didn't think it was worth more than one paragraph of his time to to spend on it and i, I agree <laughs> and so he then proposes the the, mon- the monadology and the monads and his his big he he basically says we need to start with um two things um experiences and probabilistic relationships among experiences. And uh, I agree with Leibniz again. Uh, that's what we've done in our model of conscious agents. We basically model experiences and probabilistic relationships among experiences. So, so Leibniz was there 300 years before me. Um, you know, and his no- notion of pre-established harmony, um, that I think we're going to be able to model that in the way I was talking about earlier, where I have like a big Markovian kernel for a big conscious agent. And when I take its trace chain, there's two to the N trace chains. Those are two to the N conscious agents that are all interacting. It'll look like a pre-established harmony because they're all part from this one big. Now I can't do the trace chain on the one big conscious agent, the ultimate one. I can't do that just because, well, Apple hasn't built a big enough laptop for me yet. But um, so we, we need to 
<laughs> you know, go to all of Cantor's hierarchy of infinity. So, so Apple has a little bit of work to do ahead um, for that. So, so we can't do that. But, but, uh, but I sort of can see the notion of pre-established harmony coming out uh, of, of this. But it's also very useful for me to talk about conscious agents interacting in non-trivial ways as, as independent agents looking at their interactions. So, so I mean, ultimately, I think um, Leibniz is right. But I think this other perspective is is, is useful given that we can't actually model the, the one itself. And, and finally, in terms of what kinds of, you know, testable predictions, that's what I'm working on this year. I, I want to, I'll be writing a paper and, and experiments where we try to show that we can predict precise parton distributions for protons from the theory of conscious agents. So the proton, as you, everybody knows, is one of the fundamental parts of the nucleus of protons and neutrons, the nucleus of atoms. The proton itself is one of the most complicated things humankind has ever studied. It's not a trivial little ball, and it's not just three quarks. You see three quarks, two up quarks and a down quark, at, at, at sort of low spatial resolution, Bjork and X, and, and low temporal resolution, Q squared. But as you increase your spatial and temporal resolution, you find at the highest resolutions you see a, a, a what they call a gluon sea, an ocean of gluons that are appearing and disappearing. And then as you back off on your, you know, you sort of have larger temporal, larger temporal scales, less, less temporal resolution, then you start seeing quark, anti-quark appear, disappear. So you get this quark sea. And, and then finally at the, at the crudest scale, you see um, the, the three quarks and, and then some other quarks that are appearing and disappearing. So they have momentum distributions for all York and X and all Q squareds. And, and I want to show that we can get all of those as artifacts of the spatial and temporal windows of our trace chain. In other words, these particles and their properties that we're seeing at the colliders are not an insight into a fundamental reality all of the particles and all of their properties are artifacts of the spatial and temporal resolution of, of traced by conscious agents in their observations. So, so again, I could be wrong, but, but, but you're asking for a, you know, a prediction. So uh, you know, the thing about predictions is you can be wrong. So this is the prediction that we're going to try to make, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Thank you, Don. Uh, Maran, next. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good to see you, Professor Hoffman. Um, uh, I have a question about uh, the problem of perception. So under the free energy principle, uh, perception has been defined as finding the most likely explanation or the most likely value for a hidden variable, given the current observations that, say, we have, let's say we have five sensory inputs, and at time t we are receiving five different um, sensory inputs through those five channels. And given that, uh, I'd like to predict the most likely explanation uh, for a given hit for a hidden variable that has probably caused those sensory inputs. Um, especially in artificial intelligence, uh, when we want to create smart AI models, particularly deep learning models, we are talking about a hierarchical structure of layered neurons. Um, and one of the reasons that we do that, which is also similar to what they do in predictive coding networks, is that we are having a hierarchical structure of neurons so that we might be able to infer the hierarchical uh, sequence of, you know, links of causality behind what is it like in, in, in the world out there that might have caused these sensory inputs sort of model the hierarchical structure of God knows how many hidden variables and the way they're connected to one another. Now, my, if first of all, uh, I'd like to know whether you agree with this, uh, like, 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 would this be the right, um, at least approach, try to understand in trying to understand the complicated hierarchical structure of hidden variables. And second of all, um, because, uh, I mean, let me put it this way, it seems intractable to me to, to try and uh, sort of, you know, model, uh, you know, 
potentially many, many, many such hierarchical relationships to so that we could model the world around us because it's just too complicated. So these are my two questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, great, great question. So the the idea of uh, perception as Bayesian inference is uh, you have a long history in the field. Uh, um, I, I've done some papers on that myself. Um, there's a book called Perception as Bayesian Inference. So if you there is actually a book called Perception as Bayesian Inference by edited by um, David Nill and Whitman Richards and Whitman Richards was my uh, PhD advisor. And I have a paper in that book. So I'm, I'm very interested. And I that's a 1996 book. So it's just quite old now. But um, it's, I've been interested a long time in Bayesian inference models of perception. And, and I think that they're quite powerful. Most of my colleagues who are doing that are, are assuming that um, space and time is fundamental reality and that we're, we're the Bayesian inference was we're actually finding the true physical uh, substrate behind our, our perceptions. And, and I think that that whole thing is that that interpretation of Bayesian inference is mistaken, and and if you go to the, you know, predictive processing, you know, predictive coding kind of thing, and and uh, the work on Bayes nets, for example, and, and, and the implications there, what what you see is, um, the nodes inside a Markov blanket appear to be doing this kind of um, you know, Bayesian estimation. Did you say that again? Uh, Every, every, whenever I say something that sounds like Siri, Siri on my phone starts you know, anyway. So, so, but 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 here's the key thing that 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 we know about Bayes nets. The even though it looks like the nodes on the inside are doing some kind of Bayesian inference about the world states, we know that the states of the nodes on the inside and the states of the nodes on the outside of the Markov blanket are conditionally independent given the state of the Markov blanket. That means the only thing that the nodes on the inside can never can ever know about the external world is the information on the Markov blanket. So that whole framework tells you that you're only seeing an interface. The Markov blanket is your interface and you're not, when you're doing this predictive processing, you're not predict, you're not estimating the true state of the world. You're doing something on an interface and you're using only interface variables. So you never see the truth and you're not estimating the truth. And it's just right there in the actual, you know, the fact that a Markov blanket is the set of nodes that makes the in internal nodes and the external nodes conditionally independent. That means you can't know anything more about the external nodes except what you see on your Markov blanket. So, so it, it just really highlights what I've said from evolution of natural selection and what the physicists are telling us. Not fundamental evolution tells us it's just an interface, and so does the Markov blanket that tells you it's just an interface. So they all agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. John, did you have any questions for Don? Uh, thank you, Ivy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, the one thing I guess I, as a, as a physicist, I confess, <laughs> I, um, the the one part I like, I love your. Uh, Windows interface analogy, you know, and I and I think that's really powerful. But then, I, oh, I'm I'm sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, not, not doing. Um, but I feel like I feel like I can't quite make the leap to you know my experience okay. in the world, and so for instance, the things that I have trouble with is kind of extending that to the idea that I can both see things and feel things and I can travel to those things that I see and touch them and other people can too. And they have the same experience. And I don't know, maybe I'm, I, I just feel like I'm missing something there. And I wonder if you have anything to help me over that. <laughs> sure, Perfect. sure. I think, I think the virtual reality metaphor is a big, big help here. So for people, who are playing multiplayer, so in multiplayer VR games. So I'm I'm playing with somebody in China and you know in Germany and in Argentina. And we're all playing Grand Theft Auto together, and we can all agree that oh yeah, I you know Hoffman is racing against a red Porsche, and the red Porsche is you know is, is 20 meters ahead of Hoffman, 
And, and we all agree. So we have consensus. And and and, and they might be giving me advice. You say, you know, Hoffman, you know, do a hard left there. There's, there's a shortcut. You can beat them. Something like that. So we have consensus, and it looks like there's a subjective reality, but we know that th there is no red Porsche anywhere. There's just some supercomputer, and we're, we're toggling bits. So, so when the physicists like Nima Arkani Hamed tell us that space-time is doomed, right, that, that, that it, it's not fundamental reality, they're, but they're going beyond. They're saying, okay, there is a reality beyond space and time, and by the way, beyond quantum theory. But, but they're saying that quantum theory itself is not fundamental. So, so the new structures that they're finding, like the amplitude hedron, there are no Hilbert spaces there. But the amplitude hedron is this high dimensional geometric object with um, facets and faces and edges and vertices. And it turns out that the properties of space-time and quantum theory, locality and unitarity, are coded in the phase structure of these geometric objects beyond space-time. So, so so this is so the physicists themselves, and this is only in the last 10 years. So most, by the way, I was at a conference on consciousness uh, just a couple months ago, where a, a number of, of physicists who are, are quantum theorists, so they're, they're PhDs in quantum theory, and they're looking at consciousness. At, at the end of their talks, every one of them I asked, now, are you aware of these structures beyond space time, the amplitude hedron and the decorated permutations? And to a person, they had never heard of it. <laughs> Now, 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 the reason is, is this is high energy physics, right? <laughs> Only people who are in high energy <laughs> particle physics, right, know about this stuff. And, you know, so why does a cognitive scientist know about it? Well, because I, I knew I needed to look for something beyond space time. So I've been looking for physics beyond space time. And when I found Nima, Arkani, and Hamid and their work, I realized, okay, okay, the are the ones that would be doing it. They're the ones that are pushing the envelope with the highest energies, right? They're the ones that that are going there so so it's and 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 it's nema who's saying quantum theory is doomed not just space time but quantum theory that both of those are going to arise together because if you think about it the, the you know the particles right some people are trying to boot up space time from like entanglement of, of, of particles right but, but, but what are particles particles are irreducible representations of the point Craig group of the symmetries of space time mm -hmm. so you you're you're not getting outside of space time you're you're just staying in so so quantum theory does not get you behind space time in fact all the weirdness of quantum theory the fact you need superpositions and collapse and all this stuff is a symptom of an interface it's the fact that you've lost information in projection, that's why we get the weirdness of quantum theory and the no cloning theorem and all that stuff is all an artifact of space time not being fundamental and there's this deeper reality. So now where physics is right now is, so the amplitude hedron, so here's something for a physicist. If you do the scattering amplitude computation, say for two gluons smashing into each other, four gluons spraying out, you do it in space time using quantum field theory. It's hundreds of pages of algebra, nasty, nasty math. If you do it with the amplitude hedron, three or four terms, you can compute it by hand. The math becomes trivial. Well, relatively trivial. I mean, it's all relative, um, but trivial compared to um, what you have to do with, with Feynman diagrams. And, and the other kicker is you see new symmetries. There's something called the infinite Yangian symmetry that's true of the scattering but you cannot see it in space time. You can only see it when you go beyond space time. So when the physics, when the physicists find that the math is getting simpler and you're seeing new symmetries, bye bye space time. Well, I'll be sorry to see it go, but. Uh... <laughs> well, it's a wonderful headset. It's been a useful headset. <laughs> Thank you. Move on to the you know. Yeah, uh, very quickly, Donald, uh, you didn't talk, talk about uh, the hard problem of consciousness. It seems to me, in fact, that uh, that problem still remains as a problem because you essentially created a mathematical model of, uh, you know, the effects of consciousness, not the consciousness, but the effects of consciousness, uh, where the sentience, the, the sentience is coming into play in probably all the, all the, the way you're kind of uh, portraying the reality. Can you just very quickly uh, tell us something about this? Because so, I feel that experience is something that you cannot uh, you cannot convert it into any kind of model. That is my uh, view. Right, right. So the hard problem is that it comes up if you if you assume that space and time are fundamental, and you're trying to figure out how, for example, something like neural activity could cause conscious experiences. 
and 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 there um, I've got many friends and colleagues who are working in that direction and they're brilliant but it's impossible to solve that problem um, and and the failure is clear there's you know there's for example integrated information theory what is the integrated information that must be the taste of chocolate or the smell of garlic there's not a single one that they can do same thing with the orchestrated collapse of microtubules there's not a single specific conscious experience that they can explain and I, I predict I bet good money that they'll never be able to do it because it's it's just impossible. Leibniz was right; um, it, it's impossible. So, so for me, I, I I don't have the hard problem of consciousness because I'm not trying to boot up consciousness from non non conscious ingredients. I'm saying that that whole approach is wrong. So I've got the reverse hard problem. I have to I have to show if I start with consciousness. So I'm I'm assuming consciousness. I have to show you how I give you physics in all detail. So I'm doing the reverse hard problem, and that's why I said my goal this year is to predict the parton distributions for all the quarks and gluons and so forth inside the proton. In other words, that's my reverse hard problem. So I agree that we need to solve it, but I have to go in the other direction. That one I think is, is feasible, and my, by the way, my current simulations are already very, very, um, they're, they're encouraging. At small temporal scales, I get, a, a, a gluon C, a, a, well, a, a, a massless particle C appearing, and as I increase the temporal scales, I get a C of a small. Increase the temporal scale even more, I start getting bigger particles with greater mass. So I, I get the. I've already in my simulations got the big picture now, but my goal is not just the big picture. I want to get the exact momentum distributions. But already, my my current simulations tell me, um, you know, this is in a very profitable direction. Thank you, Don. Can we move on to Ethan Prillock? Could you yeah. go straight to your question, please? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I had asked it about Delbrook earlier, and um, I'm just curious about comments as to how you have additions or subtractions or how similar to his thinking. Well, so just briefly, I mean, Delbrook did a lot of things. So what, what specific idea about Delbrook's did you want me to comment on? I mean, he's, he's, well, he he's, talked to sort of... Yeah, I mean, he talked about evolution not really providing for something that we should expect to understand, uh, you know, uh, the fitness function as modeling re underlying reality. So, uh, so I'm not familiar with that. So he, he actually said that, that, that the notion of a fitness function, the fitness payoff function is not a useful tool, you're saying? He said it wouldn't really, we shouldn't expect it because of the way evolution works that to represent the underlying reality. But he didn't, you know, he didn't talk about it in terms of, you know, operating systems. Of course, it didn't, we didn't oh, really have oh, anything well, as powerful. Well, I see. So you're, you're saying that he was sort of agreeing with me that he was saying that to, that we shouldn't expect yes. on evolutionary grounds that we don't see reality as it is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah uh, oh, absolutely. And he was a student also of, of some of the great modern, he was a doctoral student, <laughs> of, uh, one or two of the great modern physicists before he became a biologist. Right. So, so yeah, and I think he was not a reductionist, and, and I'm not a reductionist either. So, so I, I, so I'll just say yes, I agree with Delbrook on, on that, and, and of course, he he is absolutely my superior in terms of his knowledge of uh, molecular biology. And then my other one quick question too is in terms of the stuff that you were talking about these formalisms. Is there anything that would, if we stay on this side of the Planck limits, that would make a demarcation about describing features of the universe in you know, a prebiotic situation or a proto-ecology? And is there anything that would show something like that? Well, what, what I think is going to happen from the simulations I'm doing is that as I increase the windows, the spatial and temporal windows of the trace chains that I, that I do, I will get more and more complicated behaviors. And, and so I, I'm doing particles because that's the, the most trivial thing. I mean, I, I'm doing the physics because it's, it's it's the, going to be the easiest thing, and it's also where we have the most data, right? I mean, the physicists have been doing these scattering experiments for decades, and so we have tons of data. And so I, I, I'm not going after the physics because I think that that's the final thing or the, the most important thing. Is it's the thing that you can do first, and and you can get. But I eventually want to show how, as we go to larger scales of these trace chains, we will then be able to see like the emergence of cells and and, and organisms and, and greater organization. But but that's more complicated. If I went after that first, I, I wouldn't have anything to report. <laughs> I need to do the physics where we actually have a shot at, at getting a concrete result. Thank you, Don. Can we move on to Tony, please, quickly? Yeah, it's going to be uh, Don's last question. Um, OK, let me try to add something useful. How you relate physics or 
fundamental physics, particle physics, and consciousness, this part is still not clear to me. Okay, so so the uh, we just published a paper last week that you can take a look at. It, it's called Fusions of Consciousness. So if you just Google my name, Donald Hoffman, and Fusions of Consciousness, it's it's available free online, and and you'll you'll read how we make the connection. But what, what I'll say at top level is what we show in that paper is that communication or communicating classes of conscious agents um, correspond are, are what are being cataloged by decorated permutations. So the physicists found these decorated permutations beyond space time. These decorated permutations account for most of the data about scattering in space time. So we said, OK, if, if decorated permutations are the deepest thing the physicists have found beyond space time, let's take our theory of consciousness and project it onto decorated permutations. And we did. So that so we introduced new mathematics, the mathematics that takes Markov chains and maps them to decorated permutations is brand new in our paper. So that's a new contribution, as far as I can tell, to mathematics. And that tells us now that particles in space time correspond to communicating classes of conscious agents. So that's so that paper establishes that part and we, we, we're clear in the paper. We're proposing that particles in space time are projections of communicating classes of, of conscious agents. So in the next paper that we're working on, I'm going to we're planning to now make specific mapping. So, for example, what properties of communicating classes correspond to the mass of a particle? And there, as I mentioned earlier, so my proposal, and this is not published, so I'm telling you what we're working on, and, and, and if you can beat me to it, go ahead and, and publish it. You know, that would be fine. I, I, I don't care who publishes it. I just want to read the papers. I, I just want to know this stuff. So, so I'm putting my ideas out there, and, and someone who's – a lot of people who are smarter than me in this area, so you can run with it, and I'll be happy to read your papers. What we're proposing is that the entropy rate of a communicating class – corresponds to the mass and the number of states in the communicating class will will lead almost immediately or, or, or momentum and wavelengths so so those are the things that we're looking at right now but we're going to write up we're writing a paper um tentatively called traces of traces of consciousness where we use these trace chains and show how particles arise as artifacts of the trace process and all of their properties arise like the, the, the they'll then be artifacts like the entropy rate of the markovian kernel that happened to arise as an artifact of the trace chain process that will be the mass that you see so so that's how i'm proposing to get physics all of the particles and all of the properties are not fundamental reality they are artifacts of the way we observe statistical artifacts and we're going to so and that's not just a hand wave we're going to say now exactly what the statistics are and exactly how those properties are, uh, emerge as the artifacts and why you get uh, like bosons first and then only later does it condense into fermions and so forth that, that that's all going to fall out of this so thank you don i have a very um, small we... question if i may i will cry otherwise on stage uh, I'm sorry, Madei, we have to stop the interview now. Um, Don yeah. have to go. So yeah. can we all give a massive thank you to Don for today, for his time, please? Don, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Don. Okay. Thank, you. thank you so much. Okay. We'll see you later. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.